I am a Dukabor. Some of my relatives were fugitives in these mountains. Now I've come back to find them. By chance, it's the International Day of Peace. There can be no peace without justice. How can we expect peace? How could we even pray to God for peace if we ourselves are not willing to take responsibility, if only for our own personal conduct. But if you look at the course of human history, much of the strife and much of the blood has been caused by religious misunderstanding or disagreement. And even in our case as Nukobors, you had people that had fire in their eyes to go do what they thought was God's work. This is the story my grandfather used to tell me. He was just a little boy back in Russia. The Dukobors were a spiritual community with a long history of being persecuted by the church and the Tsar. In 1895, they decided to become pacifists and not participate in wars or killings of any kind. So in an act of protest, they threw all their guns in a big fire. For this, many were killed and more were tortured. Oh, I love to get away from Calgary in the summer and spend my holidays in Grand Forks. And then just hanging out on the beach. Every year in the 1950s and 60s, Mom took us to visit her family, and Cousin Marilyn was my best friend. Yeah, and didn't the boys jump off the bridge? Yeah, the boys jumped off the bridge. Yeah, that was pretty good. That was fun. Oh, wow. It hasn't changed at all. No. Nope. Well, do you dare? Yeah, oh yeah. Do you dare try to see what an innocent, peaceful, kind of a magical time it was? What I did on my summer holidays. I went to BC with my family. I played every day with my cousin Marilyn. My cousin Lance came with us. Me and Marilyn Teesman call him Lance Romance. He hates it. I like sitting in Grandma Lacton's kitchen. If I'm quiet, the old ladies tell all kinds of stories. My mother says I shouldn't tell people about the Russian stories. Mom hid things from us. She had married outside the Dukabor community. Okay, so I got another one that we can look at later. Oh, nice. Lance and I were kept away from some of our relatives. Looking back, I think they were sons of freedom Dukabors, the ones who were always in the news. Two sons of freedom sect members were convicted Wednesday on a charge of placing an explosive device and illegal ex possession of explosives. They've bombed or set fire to over $20 million worth of property. The Sons of Freedom has a reputation for parading in the new Canadian Army units in the area could have a great deal of practical experience in anti-guerrilla and anti-sabotage. They can be pulled well. back from our own Canadian world. It's been going on now for more than 60 years, and so far, no solution.
Where men shout and scream on courthouse steps. Several times during the melee, press and television photographers were accosted and asked, did you get a picture of that? Yeah. I can go back and I can understand the people who stood up and burned their arms and didn't want to fight. So it's, it's not that I have uh, no understanding about yeah. going against authority and going against the Pope and the Tsar and all that. that. You know, I agree with that. I don't know how we get from there to here. There's so much about it I don't know. What a precarious place mom and dad were in. She was a Russian Duke of War, and he was a Mountie. My mom was always sort of glamorous to have as a mother, and yet there was something hidden. Who was she? The more I get to know all this stuff, the more it'll help me get rid of my demons, perhaps, or at least know that this is where they came from. Lance's dad, my Uncle Jerry, is retired. Now he spends his time restoring old cars. I always thought it was sort of hard for you guys because mom being Russian Dukabor and she wasn't you're being... Dukabor, she was Russian. Okay. You're okay. obsessed with the Dukabor. Oh, I'm mean, not trying, I'm not, I'm not obsessed with Dukabor. You gotta watch what you emphasize and what you don't emphasize. Lance's mom and my mom were sisters. It was Since mom died, Auntie Anne, Anne is my closest relative who might have some answers. Was over with. Now the next threat perceived at that time was communism. So I'm curious about what it was like. Was it hard growing up as a Dukabor? No, we were just plain Russian people that uh, were there, sort of. So you didn't break away from the family? No, I never made a break away from my family. And that's it. I think that's enough. We've had a good life together. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and here we are, touching elbows still. Yeah, we touch elbows, but they... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, she's been a grand girl, the doll that I found, and I That's didn't right. want to lose her. You didn't question life as much as you do now. In those days, you lived your life, but now there, there's always a question about this or that or the other. There's too much of life now. The older generation doesn't like to talk about those days, but it was on TV right across the country. One evening in June 1970, six Freedomite women went to the comfortable home of the Duke of Board leader, John Berrigan, and burnt it to the ground. Cousin Marilyn took me to see John Berrigan's son, JJ. There were naked people running around torching the house and stuff, and the, my mother was yelling, and so I started yelling with my brother, you know, for neighbors to come and help, and then people came in and started putting uh, I tried to put the flames out, although it was too late. Uh, the house was burned down. In fact, I ended up living for a while with your family. Mm -hmm. uh, they were kind enough to take us in. While the media was sensationalizing uh, the depredations, here's Marilyn. How does she feel? First of all, she reads in the paper that uh, the Duke of Bors have blown this up or that up. And she's saying, that's not the Duke of Bors. That's the Sons of Freedom. And at the same time, she might have her best cousin living in Cristova. And so these divisions cut through families. These are difficult things for people to wrestle with. Maybe that's why Duke of Boris translated means spirit wrestler, because we have to wrestle with all these tensions, and we can't wrestle with them violently, and so we wrestle with them in a spiritual sense. I 
I grew up with so many questions. Why do these people burn our church down or burn uh, John Berrigan's uh, house down? I never knew why. Well, between the Freedomites and the Orthodox Duke of Boers and the Independents, it's not easy. Yeah, and here's two sisters, Janice's mom, my mom. I think your mom and my mom, they were trying to be very English. So. They were more, they, yeah. Very they never, yeah, yeah. yeah. I felt that, that I've had a rebellion inside myself that uh, sometimes I feel it's come through the generations in my ancestry and, and that I've been not even living my own life. This is like, um, like you're driving off the end of a cliff. I know Grandpa was saying when they first came here that it was the Ukrainian neighbors that taught them how to insulate their houses properly. They didn't know anything about um, how to build for this kind of weather because where they had lived in the, in the Caucasus was warm. And he told me that he built his first house for his family out of thick, thick cement. Yeah. And he figured they'd be really cozy. No. And they just froze. He said the inside, it was colder inside that house than it was outside. So they had to move out and there were some Ukrainian neighbors that took them in for the rest of the winter. Okay. But he said the problem was that you couldn't tear down that cement stuff, right? So it was just stood there being an embarrassment to them. <laughs> in Russia, the Orthodox Church looked upon us Duhobors as heretics. The Tsar exiled us to the edges of the empire. Our leader, Peter Lordley Verigin, was sent to Siberia, and we had only his letters. The priest took our children away, but we find strength in God. The suffering help us to attain his spirit. So Janice, was this just the prayer house or did people actually do you know stay in here? I think it was the prayer house. Just the prayer house. Yes. You know, it looks like the, the roof was leaking. A Dukobor believes that all life comes from the spirit. All things that are good are a manifestation of the Creator. The Creator is present in each of us as we go about our daily lives. When we burned arms in Russia in 1895, the Cossacks attacked us with horses and whips. With each blow, I flinched, not from the pain, but from the lawlessness of feeling anger and animosity towards that Cossack. But I held fast and resisted the evil feelings. Leo Tolstoy, who wrote War and Peace, wrote another book where he said basically that the main problem between people is that they don't understand that love is a fundamental law of human life. And um, he became a sort of a protector for the Duke of Ors and a, a real soulmate, I think, for Peter Lordly Berrigan, who was the leader of the Duke of Ors at the time. Esteemed Brother Tolstoy, the question of nonviolent resistance to evil is completely answered in my mind. I offer you, on behalf of the whole community, our sincere and heartfelt gratitude for your guidance. 
I wanted to know your opinion on sending the Dukobors abroad to escape persecution. The members of our community are in need for self-improvement. So wherever we went, we would take our weaknesses with us. My dear brother, I was especially happy to read your ideas on the resettlement of the Duca boys. I share your opinion completely, namely that it's not the place where we live that is important or the conditions surrounding us, but our inner mental state. You shall know the truth, and the truth will set you free everywhere. We're sitting talking in the front of this picture of Leo Tolstoy. He, in one of his writings, called Dukobor's people of the 25th century. In that respect, I regard Dukoborism as beyond religion. Because of the community of values, of uh, beliefs that uh, he shared, and uh, his expectations of the Dukobor people to actually uh, live his philosophy. He then dedicated his energies to seeking a place where our people could have been released to go. Canada was chosen, and Tolstoy assisted not only in the arrangements, but uh, financially as well with the royalties from his novel, Resurrection. The majority came over in 1899. The number that is used is approximately 8,000. It was the largest migration in Canada's history. Canada needed immigrants to populate the frontier. These people needed a place to go to get away from the persecution. And so I think a lot of verbal arrangements were made. Our people thought that they were coming to a place where they would be allowed to live according to their beliefs and where there would be no state intrusion into their lives. Uh, and the only state they knew was the Russian autocracy. And so when they came over, they were allowed to settle as communities and to own the land in common. Let's go find Alex. He's lived here all his life. When the Dukobors came to Canada, the first year they wintered in the caves, half a mile south of here. And the first thing they did in the spring was to build this barn. And Peter, Lord Lisbergen's mother, was here in charge of everything, together with Alyosha Mahorta. They ruled for the first couple of years. They were the leaders. And this was the seat of government for all the Dukobors of Canada. It started right here. And what year was that built, did you say? 1901, that was the first year. Our village was a place of women, babies, the old, and the sick. All the healthy men were away working on the railway for wages. We were lonely, even as we worked together all day. In that prayer house like we went to see, yep. how many other ones did you say they made all the same? Those brick buildings, yeah. there's 42 villages. They had the horses, they had cattle, they built roads, they had telephones. And by 1902, they already petitioned the governments to release Peter Lord Lieberg. Mm -hmm. And he came, and they had buildings and a place for him across the road there. OK. Wow. Peter Verigan had spent 15 years in exile. He was 48 when he joined the Duke of Wars in Canada, and a powerful man. He had 
have women singing on the front of the Oh yeah. They'd have uh, eating so eat a lot of borscht and pirashki <laughs> and cream. Okay. That's a good life. Yeah. Dear brother Virigin, you will forgive me if I take the liberty to advise you and those around you. Don't get carried away, dear friend, by the material success of your community. I'm certain you know this and feel the same way, but we cannot repeat an idea too often if it's the right one. Your loving brother, Leo Tolstoy. Dear brother Lev Tolstoy, your concerns are valid, but I cannot refuse to accept that people want to build material progress. It seems to me that the whole world was created and exists for a good. So why should material goods serve us evil? We've had to build more than 60 villages. The climate is too cold to stay in the open air. Each household needs food to eat. What would you have done? Probably not clasped your hands together and looked up to the sky expecting manna to fall? But there were many Dukabors who thought like Tolstoy. They believed material wealth would corrupt their spiritual life. Three years after they arrived, 1,500 set their animals free, left their new houses, and began a pilgrimage across the prairie. You had in that group of several thousand Dukabors, some that uh, felt that their whole role in life was to go out and share God's word as they understood it. And this is a tradition that has a long history in Russia of people wandering and preaching the word of God and being taken care of. In the group that made that trek, you would find people who later became community Dukabors, possibly even people who are now regarded as independent Dukabors because there were no lines in the sand at that time. Most Dukabors backed away from the religious fervor, but some clung to their zeal and staged more pilgrimages, sometimes naked. They became known as the Sons of Freedom, and by 1905, divisions in the Dukabor community became a fact of life. There's families that go through all of them, where you have a brother that rages against the quote-unquote Verrigan rule and a sister that regards Verrigan as their salvation. Deviz Duchoborcev, Trud i Mirne Zizin. That's the Dukabor precept, toil and peaceful life. The welfare of the whole world is not worth the life of a single child. That's what we believed. I grew up right at that time when there was all the bombings. And um, so when I grew up, I, I was ashamed to be a Dukabor. Re I really was. Even though I went through the choir, through the Sunday school, Russian school, everything, and I learned all the prayers and everything, but to anybody English, I was ashamed that I was from Grand Forks, that I was a Duke of Bor. <laughs> Until many years, many years later, actually even right now, I can be honest with you. Dear brother Tolstoy, I fear we are entering a turbulent time here in Canada. The local residents especially are beginning to regard the Dukabors with some envy, since the Dukabors, through their community organizations, are able to raise their standard of living more quickly and so get ahead of the English. Six years after the Dukabors arrived, the uh, government changed and the new Borden government put more pressure on the Dukabors to sign up to the regular agreements in the Homestead Act. 
So that's where the difficulty arose, to register and to own land individually. Uh, to do that, you had to take out titles. You had to swear oaths of allegiance. Our people's understanding of the oath of allegiance was, in their mind, just a first step to military service. All the lands registered in the Duke of Bourg's name have been declared free. The government has cast the die, so to speak. Whether it can win or not, only time will tell. Five thousand Dukeborgs lost their land. But our grandfather and his side of the family did sign the government papers. The crisis over land deepened the splits within the community. Those who signed and decided to stay in Saskatchewan became known as independent Dukeborgs. Peter Verrigan denounced them. But the majority, the Freedomites and Verrigan's loyal Orthodox Dukeborgs, followed the leader to begin a new life in British Columbia. and bought land with borrowed money, thereby avoiding the issue of swearing oaths of loyalty. Uh, and uh, between 1908 and 1911, about 6,000 Duke of Wars came to British Columbia. It feels great to be with the women of Maryland's family. The Zebrofs were in the very first group that came to the Grand Forks area. They still remember communal life. Polly, and those are the oldest Arishenkovs, way, way, way out there. Yeah, Arishenkovs, yeah, Arishenkovs. There was lots of us kids that living in the cedar room. Every morning before the sun came up, we all had to get up and stand where the sun is going to come up and sing Blagodatne Solnushka. Deeply esteemed Lev Tolstoy, I hasten to inform you of our community's joy. Our brothers and sisters all want you to come and stay with us, perhaps to live out the remainder of your precious days in peace here in British Columbia. I feel such images as these groups of children would provide a significant reward for your long labors as a fighter for truth. I embrace you as a son and in brotherhood. Lovingly, Peter Verrigan. A lot of people regard that time as the golden age. They were able to plant orchards throughout the Kootenays, build roads and bridges that not only they used, but the rest of the population used as well. And then uh, to regulate and organize community life. Under Lord Lee's leadership, we set up the biggest experiment in communal living ever attempted in North America. We sit at the table, the Lord's Prayer was said, and then we started eating. Yeah. In the same kitchen? 
all in the same tables, of course, everybody ate together. We have to go and work in the community. And I was the one who had to write everything as soon as the tales are full. Christian Community Universal Brotherhood. Yeah, yeah Brilliant BC, the Jam Factory. <laughs> yeah, she got married 15 years 15 old. 15 years old, yeah. Madly in love. Oh, yes. <laughs> she thought he'd run away. I would probably uh, get married at 20. <laughs> well, uh, say, I'll say it was a mistake. I should have waited. <laughs> <laughs> Too young. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but then the world went mad. The first world war broke out. Canada was part of it. The BC government started militia training in the schools. The Dukabors could not accept this, and many kept their children away. They were exempted from military service. They stayed home and prospered. But when the veterans returned from the war, there was bitter resentment. In BC, Dukabors lost the right to vote. And then, to make matters worse, there was Russia. There was an event in 1917 that scared the bejesus out of our people here in Canada. It was called the Russian Revolution. And they saw us, Russians, living communally, wanting to retain our uh, original uh, ethnicity. And so they saw us as fifth columnists. And so everybody was freaked out. Here come the commies, here come the commies. In 1924, Peter Verrigan was killed in a mysterious train explosion. There has never been an official explanation. Dukabors of all shades believed the government was involved. They feared their children would be turned against Dukabor beliefs. They burned down several schools. The death of Peter Lordley, my great-great-grandfather, was a tragedy that I don't know if the Dukabor community has ever recovered from. Verrigan's son was brought over from Russia to lead the Dukabors. Peter Chistikov Verrigan became a controversial leader. Chistikov could be taken as perjure, or it could be taken as cleanser. And those people that don't care too much for Chistikov usually call him the perjure, and those people that have a high regard of him call him the cleanser. It was the Great Depression. The community had mortgaged its assets. In 1932, Chistikov expelled all those families who couldn't pay their dues. They were kicked out with only the clothes on their backs. The dispossessed took off their clothes, showing the world they had nothing. 200 began a march towards Chistikov's village. Other Dukabors took their clothes off and joined them in sympathy. More than 600 were arrested. They were transported to an island prison and their story was buried.
Somewhere in these archives are the names of our relatives who we lost track of. But these names, they're severed, meaning they're off limits? Yes. It's just if you were to ask to look at those individual files... The names you, would be you, taken from them. You, you can't look at them. So but how if, would we know if it's related to us? <laughs> This is almost sounding like why we're doing this search in the first place, because so much was hidden. These 20 years I've been living in these valleys, and I didn't have a clue about all the things that have been going on here. I found one name. I think it's one of the old ladies in our grandmother's kitchen in my summer holidays. This is going to take us to Cristoba, home of the Freedomites, the place where all those news stories about fires and nude protests have come from. I've never been to Cristoba before. And I'm a little bit nervous about it. Слободники <laughs> Такцию не платили, чтобы войну не поддерживать. Их общинники погнали. Жили там на общинской земле все вместе. Их погнали отель. Это уж как я еще молодая была, дитё. Родители поскидали свою платью. Если берете, нас гоните с двора, то и забирайте нашу платью. стали Богу молиться, разобрались голые, полиция приехали и начали бить каталками. Одна женщина упала, голову ей пробили, другая упала, голову ей пробили, кровь текет. Подогнали троки и начали на троки сажать и возить. This was their jail. It must have been like Alcatraz. What a place to build a penitentiary. Piers Island looks like a paradise. Well, the other side, there was a government wharf where they used to bring the supplies in. Okay. <laughs> the government came down hard. They changed the penalty for public nudity from three weeks to three years in the federal penitentiary. And then they built this prison, especially for the 600 Dukabor men and women. I was looking through the newspapers, like looking through newspaper clippings under, under Dukabor, just seeing whatever there was there. And the one that kind of stopped me in my tracks and, and gave me goosebumps was just a little sort of sidebar article saying, third Duke baby dies. This is your family? Uh, this was taken, taken in 1932, and we were like my mother, uh, my sister, my brother, and this is my auntie. And we were arrested and we were taken to Nelson 
jail. This is the baby that was taken away from, from the mother and uh, that was the last that my mother had seen of it. It died in the care of the authorities there and uh, they only came and told my mother that the baby died. We were in Nelson and shipped out, and my mother got arrested, and she was pregnant, and uh, she had the baby in jail. And the kids, three of them that, that perished, were a few weeks younger than my brother Bill. Amatira были тут, а, и вот детей брали, как их брали э, маленьких от грудей. Они кричали, спробовали прятаться. Полицейские подходили, они незнакомые для детей, они спробовали прятаться, кричали к матери, к грудью прислонялись. Жалости прямо не было ничуть. Но мы чуть больше были и шли сами на, на вагоны нас сажали. Матеря падали, одна упадет, другая упадет, третья упадет. В обморок. Дети кричат, виск был, шум был, крик был. My sister and brother were taken away and they were put into a private home somewhere. In the course of time, they forgot their own language. They began speaking English only. Under something called the Superintendent of Neglected Children, mm -hmm. they have a whole series of records because a lot of the kids of the parents that were arrested, mm -hmm. they were put in orphanages, they were put in foster homes, some were, were sent to reform schools, mm -hmm. and none of these kids had done anything. Yeah. Their stories are hard to listen to. Some girls got their teeth knocked out on the very first day. Down in the basement, there's a special cell for punishment. This was their first taste of school. Three under eighty. It was my number. Came first to Pierce Island, and my mom was in. Uh, Ocala, and then she came after, and her number was 530. Where's memory? This is what I will never forget, these numbers. When we came to Pierce Island in six months, every mother, every father didn't have a word from their child, not one of them, and it's, it was terrible for the ladies that have children there. Yeah. After six months, some were coming through, but the letters were censored, blacked out, and mothers go wild. They don't know what, what really is outside there with their children. How mothers are wishing to hold them and hug them, kiss them. I think it was close to springtime sometime. 
Mr. Brankin came along and he announced that all kids were going home. I remember Bill Martin, he was an older boy. He says, Sam, watch, your brother and sister will be on this train. I walk to the train. I couldn't see nobody. I see kids. And in fact, the two of them held on to me. Sam, Sam. And I says, who, who, who could that be? And I kind of shrugged myself away. After a while, Bill Markin takes me to them, and sure enough, there are the kids. I remember when my mother and dad came. It was all getting used to each other again. We, uh, and it wasn't the same anymore. When we returned, my mother was still in jail in Nelson. My brother Paul uh, was so disturbed emotionally that he couldn't even come near her. As I was growing up, I dreaded to go to school. I dreaded to learn English. That's because of what the English people had done to us. I pray to God continuously I can forgive. I hate to say this. I don't know if I can. Because I was innocent. And may God forgive them too. I, uh, I forgive. I forgive. It is, uh, if you would carry a grudge, you could kill. I experienced this in 1960 when my daughter was taken away. There were times I could kill. Pierce Island drove a steel wedge between Freedomites and Orthodox Dukabors. None of the families were allowed back in their old communities after their release from prison. They became squatters on public land. In 1938, the communal enterprise of the Orthodox Dukabors went bankrupt, making everyone a squatter. By 1950, as the Cold War took hold, the children of Pierce Island were adults, and they were angry. 
1950, 400 sons of freedom are imprisoned for nudism or arson, often for burning their own houses or those of orthodox dukabors. They keep to their secretive ways, refusing to pay taxes and register births, deaths, and marriages. Their hymns caution against the accumulation of worldly goods. They sing, those shall suffer only sorrow who their wealth desire to save. They say it is their beliefs that have brought them into conflict with their neighbors. As Dukobors, we have enough uh, challenges in our lives without having to be uh, caught up in larger issues. At the height of the Cold War, we had, first of all, the surrounding society questioning our patriotism. And they had every right to, because we are not patriots, but neither are we stooges. My grandmother spent 15 years in Stalin's gulag. This is at the same time that my family here was being accused of being communist spies. The Department of National Defense this week is appealing to all Canadians to prepare for a possible atomic disaster. Schools and major industries are asked to help in the preparations. Against that background of fear and uncertainty and almost a siege mentality, you have that hysteria being cranked by our government's response and own actions. Night and day, spot check roadblocks are maintained throughout the area. If the name Smith appears on your driver's license, you'll be hastened through. But if it's Smithkoff, your vehicle is thoroughly gone over. A special police lab is maintained at Nelson where instruments of destruction which have failed to detonate are searched for fingerprints. At the moment, more than 100 Freedomites, ranging in age from 22 to 74, are in prison or on bail charged with terrorism. You have the Kootenays being an armed camp because of the depredations and disturbances, some of which history, if has not shown yet, will show were instigated by agents provocateurs that were not Dukobor, that were not Sons of Freedom, that were not even Russian. I, I guess we'll have to wait for a while for that. Here in the National Archives is the file. The RCMP had a special unit, the D Squad, to keep track of what they called the Dukobor problem. The Mounties generated 41 meters of who knows what. The government still won't let us see what actually went on. It must have been very hard on the Orthodox Dukobors and the, the other Dukobors that were not Sons of Freedom because, of course, they were all lumped in together. All oh, these Dukobors, Dukobors this, Dukobors that. Let's take some of these Duke of Wars and the main ones and put a bounty on their heads, as far as I'm concerned. I'd like to see them all get blown up. Uh, what do you think the police should do? Do you think the troops should be brought in, perhaps? Bring your troops in there and blow them up again. They, uh, they would strip and sing all the time. Back then, everybody was pretty prudish. As far as I know, it was only Paris Match that would use uh, photographs that showed more than just the top part of women. That was as far as it ever went. Life magazine used my stuff about three times, I think. Usually it was the women that stripped. But uh, this time, I was the only reporter photographer there. And so being a woman, the men stripped. And then they stood there in all their glory, waiting for me to take their pictures. And I was embarrassed, because I was quite young, probably about 18. There was this old fellow that uh, was one of the sons of freedom. 
One time he, uh, he came up to me in the bus depot in Nelson in the coffee shop. He said, uh, hey, can you give me a dime for the locker? He said, I don't seem to have any. I want to use the locker. I said, oh, sure, Tim, here you go. I gave him a dime. And that night, 3 o'clock in the morning, boom! <laughs> the, the lockers in the bus depot blew up. And I thought, oh, my God, that was my dime that opened that locker and put the bomb in there. I did all the mundane things, too, like taking baby pictures and weddings. But uh, when anything uh, came up, when the police or newspapers phoned, I was out there like a shot, <laughs> forgetting all the rest of the, the jobs I should be doing. It was, for me, it was fun. Yes, I'm looking for books on uh, Duke of Wars. Ah, so we'll be down in here in the Canadian section. All right, Dorothy, where did you put the Duke of War books? Oh. There you are, right under the flag. This is the book that fueled all the paranoia about the Duke of Wars. In your book, the solution that you proposed was that the children be taken away from their parents and given enforced education. How do you feel about it now? Well, uh, my solution was basically that the government sit down and stop and think about these people and then, if necessary, take the children away more from the training in crime and, and lawlessness and anti-education. Take away the children. That's what they did to the Duke of Bors in Russia, and that's what they did to the families they sent to Pierce Island. And one generation later, in the 1950s, it began again. The government said it was about schooling. Somewhere around here is a cousin I never met. I never met Vera on my summer vacations because she had been taken away. have to be covered completely because they will, as soon as they come up, they'll open up and then we'll be canoeing. We Vera is so lucky. <laughs> She's got her daughters and her grandchildren living all around her. I missed out on being kids with her. Okay. The other way. Sideways. Okay. Debate, Marie. Top rack? Top rack. Okay. Timer. Timer for how long? I should put on for 10 minutes. You asked about different childhoods, Aww. and this is what the grandchildren ask now, seven years old. But so my, my life was a little bit different because at that time they were taking the Duke War kids away. The BC Attorney General has announced that the first step towards ending the lawlessness in the Kootenays will be to remove the school aid children of the Sons of Freedom sect. Approximately 200 children will be located and interned in a modern residential institution at New Denver. Robert Bonner, Attorney General of British Columbia and administrator of Dukabor problems, explains his government's policy to close up Douglas Leiterman. Couldn't you have set up a curriculum, for instance, which they would have accepted and allowed them to have their own schools? I don't think any curriculum under, under public administration would be acceptable. Uh, we have had no suggestion of effective compromise in the period under which we have been operating. They tell us that the government has never offered to compromise in this direction. <laughs> I don't know that the government has to offer to compromise. We are charged with the responsibility of administering certain statutes in the province. Uh, uniformly toward our entire population. They would come at daytime, they'd come at nighttime, and I had a hiding spot. You know when you're sleeping, when you fall asleep? 
And my mom would wake me up and say, hurry up and hide. So in my pajamas, I'd go. For three years, this last year. Mm -hmm. They cleaned out. Everybody was gone except the two of us were left. And at daytime, we never went out to go snow, to go out play in the snow. Then we had to wait till all the rest of the kids came from school. Then we wouldn't be noticeable. So one time, I don't know why, we're at, I guess we snuck away from our mothers or something. And we're in our snowsuits. And all of a sudden, we hear everybody screaming. And I thought, like, uh-oh. So we laid down in the snow. But one is wearing navy, one is wearing red. I mean, we were bright enough for anybody to see. And when we looked up, and there was a policeman standing there. Oh, maybe 100 feet away. And another one is yelling to him, do you see them? And this one just stood and looked at us, and he said, there's nobody here. But did the policeman see you when he just said that no? That's right. He's seen us, but he didn't. Mm. So there was all, oh, there were good people then. I'm sure I wouldn't have wanted their job. Some were nice, but some weren't nice. But some came actually with pitchforks. <laughs> they did. Some more time went by. They came. And we heard a window open, they crossed through a window. And they opened the door to the closet. See, these are the policemen that had the door open their way in here. For you to come? Yes. They like carry guns, and, like handcuffs and stuff. They had guns, they had handcuffs. This is, this is the RCMP of Canada. And the only thing I can remember about that day is someone gave me an orange. I don't know if it was my mother or the other girl's mother. And I remember holding this orange. And they took us to Nelson. I had to appear before a judge. I got my sentence. He sentenced me. He, he said, you are going to be in New Denver till you are 15 years of age. Get her out of here. We seem to be making an, an effort, and it seems to be a good effort, uh, to make good Canadians of these people. But uh, they ask uh, why they can't just be allowed to be good Dukeborns. Isn't this satisfactory? Doesn't this country have room for other types of minorities who all contribute to making up the fabric of Canada? I think that question may be asked of you without your appreciation of the basic Dukebor philosophy. It, it's a form of passive opposition to, or to state control. You learned not to cry. What if you And if you happen? cried, you made sure that nobody seen you when you cried. But you would cry, you would cry at night time. Like when you were sleeping, you would just shove your head in the pillow and cry? Yeah. Were you allowed to bring, like, a stuffed animal? We had dolls. Like, when you were there, like, did you feel that it was, like, the end of your life, the end of the world? Like, oh, I'm never going to see my parents again, or this is the end of the world? Yes, we were. And it felt like the end of the world. Do you think they're happy here, Mrs. Lyons? Well, I don't know. I often look at them and think you wouldn't wish to see a happier bunch of children. Just maybe after visiting day, they're a wee bit. Well, it's natural. Well, what happens on visiting day? Well, they seem just a little bit resentful of us. I've noticed that. <laughs> Uh, 
And of course, I always kept uppermost in my mind that the parents were lawbreakers. They had to have some punishment. How do you mean lawbreakers? Well, they're not bringing their children to school, and that's the law of Canada. This is a picture of my dad. He was at a visit. He did a lesson. But what if that happens again? Like what? Cause see, never. Where, where do the boys? Never. Um, what never. Never. You don't speak Russian. Never no will it happen. It'll never happen again, Nicole. Nobody could ever take over my, my dead body. Me. Nobody will ever take you away. We're going to over school. my dead body. For any reason. We are standing here holding hands and offering our prayers in the memory of the victims of the tragedies in the United States and uh, their families. And so it's indeed a very tragic day. It has not been a day of peace. Here we are, September 11th. You know, a decade after the collapse of the Soviet Union, we live in a world fraught with conflict, fraught with tension. We're proud of saying that our forebearers, when they made these noble stands for their beliefs, took on the might of the entire Tsarist Empire. And I'm proud to belong to a group of people that stands against the tide, that does what's not easy, but what's what, what is right. Possibly the Dukabor community as a whole is coming out of its nightmare. In the last little while, there has been a rapprochement, a reconciliation between the Sons of Freedom and the community in Dukobors. Think hard today. We're going to work on random acts of kindness. This is a strategy that's... And I don't know what a Dukobor is going to look like a hundred years from now, if there is going to be that kind of an entity. Our people, in our prayers, said that a person is not a Dukobor by a, a heritage or by birth, but more by what they hold in their soul and in their hearts. <laughs> we as Dukobors have come out to embrace the world because we have to. You can't run and hide anymore. So I look forward to working with all people of goodwill, regardless of race, color, or creed, and collaborating and cooperating and respecting and, yes, even loving them. <laughs> 